but I want to give you an example of a youth in particular. This man used to dress the nicest, he used to look the nicest. By the Mushrikun standard, if, if there was a GQ magazine then, he'd be on the cover, right? He used to get all imported clothes. His shoes used to come from Yemen. That's like saying he you know, wore Giorgio Armani suits. Or I don't know who the, who the top designer is. They all look retarded to me, but anyway. So <laughs> anyway, so he, he wore really nice clothes and imported perfume and, you know, Mus'ab bin Umayr before he became Muslim. Very, very smart man, very handsome man. Many women wanted to marry him. Young guy, very smart, very intellectual. So even the chieftains were very proud that they have this man, this pride of their town in, in Mecca, in their household. He heard that the Muslims are being persecuted. He said, I, gotta, you know, I was curious about what this Muhammad is saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me go find out. So he goes and sneaks into Darul Arqam to find out. He listens to a khutbah of Rasulullah Sallallahu as he's conducting a halaqa with the Sahaba. And he says, this is what my heart had been saying all along. He accepts. He says, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He makes salah with them. Now he starts coming to the halaqas regularly, secretly. He doesn't want people to find out because to find out in Mecca would be a big problem. Especially with his mother, Khunnas bint Malik. His mother was a very powerful woman. She had a, she had a very controlling personality. He wasn't afraid of anybody else except his mother. Didn't want to mess with his mom, like many of us. Right? We, you can take on anybody, but you can't get on mom's bad side. So he's sneaking in, and one of the one of the kuffar they saw he saw him, and word spread, and finally got to his mother. So they called a town meeting from his tribe. They pulled him in. They said, "Is this true? You become a Muslim? Somebody seen you pray like Muhammad prays, and we saw you go into Darul Arqam. What's going on?" He said, "Yes, I become Muslim." I, what can I say? He accepted. He acknowledged. His mother's first reaction was to try to spear him. She was that mad. Then to hit him, but she couldn't do it. She loved him too much. So what she decided to do was she tied him up and she put him in the corner of the house with guards watching him the whole day. For days. Many, many days. He stayed in his house, just not even being able to scratch himself, just tied up. Because he had accepted Islam. Then some news came, he heard from outside, or some of the, slave, some of the guards were talking, that some Muslims are fleeing to Abyssinia, to Habasha. He heard about it, the next chance he got when the guards weren't paying attention or sleeping, he escaped. And he went with them to Habasha, he left his family. He comes back, and then he went back again, but eventually when he did come back, his mother caught him again and she said, you better leave this Islam business, otherwise I'm going to tie you up again. He goes, you can do it, but whoever you hire to tie me up this time, I will kill them. And she knew he meant it, so you know, she didn't try it again. But then the least thing she could do, you know what she said to him? She said, you know what, this wealth you enjoy, these clothes you're wearing, these brand name and these imported shoes and imported perfumes and thobes and everything, this is not yours, this is from my wealth. Her exact words were, I can no longer be a mother to you. So leave this wealth. He's leaving his house, his uncle stops him. He says, you know these clothes you're wearing right now, they're from your uncle. They're from your father, your late father. So they don't belong to you either. Take them off if you want to stay with Islam. He, the man who everybody looked to for fashion standards, the guy who was like, you know, this, the, the most handsome man, the most respected young man in the society, had to leave his house covering his shame with his hands. He had to leave his house naked. This is the state of Musa bin Umayr, radiallahu anhu. Comes to Rasulullah, gets some, you know, some garb to wear, and now he starts, you know, and totally commits himself to the task of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, learning the Quran constantly. He's sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, learning and memorizing the Quran, and he was one of the most beautiful reciters of the Quran. So now the six people come from Medina. And the Prophet has to send Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a helper to go teach the deen. He has many choices. There are seniors like Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar bin Khattab, right? Why does he choose Mus'hab? He's young, he's already shown his will to sacrifice, and he's a beautiful reciter, so he can bring people with his charm of recitation, even, to the deen. So the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Mus'hab bin Umair to Medina. He goes to Medina, he's living with somebody else as a guest. And he starts going every single day next neighbor's house, this one's house, that one's house, reciting Quran to them, bringing them to Islam, slowly but surely. And people, if they didn't come to Islam, they were mesmerized by the Quran, so they would come and sit in his gatherings. Which bothered the chiefs of the tribes. One of the chiefs heard about this, he got really mad. One day Musab was sitting outside in public giving the dars, teaching Quran. And he came with a spear and said, you better stop talking to my tribe or I will kill you. And Mus'ab, young man, if anybody else comes up to us, you're holding an MSA meeting, some guy walks in here. You Muslims better stop this, or I'm going to take care of you outside in the parking lot. Right? 
Oh, he's like, oh yeah, bring it on. You know, this is what we would do. You know what he says, Musa bin Umayr? He looks at this guy threatening him, and he says, well, why don't you listen to what I have to say? If you accept it, well and good. If you reject it, I'll stop bothering you. He says, sounds fair. Put his spear, stuck it in the ground. He sat down, and Musa bin Umayr started reciting the Quran. Very calmly. And the man heard it, and he said, this is the truth. How can I enter this religion? And he became a Muslim. And then he said, oh, wait a second. I know a man, if he accepts, then his whole tribe will accept. Let me get him for you. And he went and got him too. And before this happened, incidentally, this was the chief of a tribe, right? He comes to Musab bin Umayr and said, what can I do to enter this religion? Musab says, you have to go take a shower first and wear clean clothes. Then come back. So he goes, takes a shower, comes back, and then Musab bin Umayr. Ibn Umayr takes shahada from him, and then from the other tribes, and huge chunks you know, of, of Medinan tribes start coming into Islam. So Musa bin Umair was the, the, the trendsetter for history. What we have now, what the Rasul had as a refuge in Medina was the work of Allah through Musa bin Umair. This youth who decided to give up his wealth. In Medina when the Prophet came, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one time he was giving a, a, a khutbah, a dars. And Musa bin Umair came and sat in the majlis. And a lot of people looked at him from Makkah, the, the ones that knew him. They looked at him and they looked down like this in shame. And a lot of them started crying. You know why? Because he was wearing a torn blanket. This was the man they remembered wearing grand name clothes and you know, amazingly dressed. Nobody dressed as good as he did. Now he's wearing all of this only because he decides he's going to sacrifice all of his preferences for the sake of Allah. So some Sahaba even started crying. And, Musab, and Muhammad وسلم, even looked at him and said, I remember you, you used to be very, very well dressed. Your family used to dress you well. They used to feed you well. And then the Prophet وسلم, advised and, and actually congratulated the believers that Allah will give them kingship of when they will have different clothes to wear in the day and different, different clothes to wear in the night. And the Sahaba said, will we be better off then? And the Prophet said, no, you're better off now. You're better off right now when you don't have anything. Because then the love of dunya, what the Prophet meant, the love of dunya will enter into your hearts. In any case, Mus'ab ibn Umayr, at the battle of Badr, his brother is captivated. He's one of the prisoners with the Muslims. The Rasul sallallahu said, take good care of the prisoners. So his brother is prisoner and the Sahaba, they're eating food, they're eating rice and they're drinking water and they're giving the same amount of rice and water to him. Musa ibn Umayr walks by and he looks at his brother and he says to the guard, my brother, tie this kafir up tightly because his mother is rich, she'll probably give a good ransom to us. And his brother looks at him like, you're not talking to him, are you? You're talking to me, right? He goes, no, no, you're not my brother, that's my brother. His iman was such that he understood just like Nuh was made to understand. Those who are not in the boat are not your family. Those who fight against this deen, they're not your family. Those who believe with you, Those who have iman and engage in righteous deeds, we will enter them into a new affiliation, a new family of the righteous. You're being indoctrinated into a new family. Those who struggle with you in the way of this deen. So this was the character of Mus'ab ibn Umayr. But I haven't gotten to the real part yet. What, how Allah honored him. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him. In the battle of Uhud we know some Sahaba, and, we, and I'll say this and please understand it carefully, made an unconscious mistake. It wasn't a conscious disobedience of Rasulullah, but it was a misunderstanding at the hands of the Sahaba. So they came down from their positions. You know the famous incident, right? Now what happened was the mushrikun, their target was to assassinate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So their attack coming down from the hill was targeted towards Rasulullah. Musa ibn Umayr was a smart man. He understood this. And he was the flag bearer. So he grabs the flag, stands apart in the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so to direct traffic towards him, and starts screaming takbir. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Why? So the people who are going to assassinate him, would get their direction, attention towards him first. So people start coming towards him and attacking him. A horseman comes by, chops off his arm, his right arm, from here. He was holding his, his, the, the, the flag in the right arm. He grabs it in the left arm. And as he grabs it, he knows. Why is he doing this? His love of Rasulullah that he's willing to let go, right? Of everything, of his own life. So he says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرُّسُولٌ Muhammad is nothing except a messenger. Messengers passed before him too. 
So even though I'm doing this for the sake of Muhammad, in the end I'm doing this for Allah. He knew this, he clarified this to himself, even though he knew it was hurting him that the attack to Muhammad is becoming more and more opened up. So he kept reminding himself, screaming as his arm is chopped off, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ the, the kuffar came and they chopped off the other side. Now whatever he has left of his arms, he's holding the flag like this, screaming, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ They came and they speared him and he died in that state. And then afterwards, afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored what was in his heart and he put this ayah in Surah Ali Imran in the description of the battle of Uhud you find this ayah وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ Muhammad is nothing except a messenger messengers came before him too أَفَإِمَّاتَ if in case he died أو قُتِلَ or if he got killed أَنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ are you going to turn back on your heels? فَمَنْ يَنْقَلِبْ عَلَىٰ عَقِبَيْ the one who turns back on his heels فَلَنْ يَضُرَّ اللَّهَ شَيْئًا he could not harm Allah in anything وَسَيَجْزِ اللَّهُ الشَّاكِرِينَ and Allah will soon reward the shakirin those who are grateful when Muhammad and Rasulullah looked at the body of Umayyad you know the, the shuhada were being given salams on the battlefield these young men were give, being given salams by the, the, the because the Prophet had instructed us even to this day that we're supposed to say salam on the shuhada for they respond to the salams according to the hadith of Rasulullah so the, the, the sahaba that survived the battle they're going around giving salams to the shuhada they got to the body of Musa ibn Umayyad and all of them started crying and when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa saw his body, you know what he said? He said, فَمِنْهُمْ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ They are from, this is an ayah of the Qur'an that he recited when he looked at him. You know, we can recite these ayahs. But when these ayahs were recited by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it was something else. He said, from among the believers are real men that have already confirmed their covenant that was made with them. That Allah had made with them. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ Then from among them are those who have given their due already. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ And from among them are those who are still waiting to give their due. وَمَا بَدَّ الْتَنْبِيلَ And they would not re- replace their desire to give their due, to give their whole life to Allah with anything else. They would not replace it for anything. This is the ayah of Muhammad Wasallam recited upon the body of Muslim ibn Umayyad. As he lay, you know one of the reasons the Sahaba were crying? His cloth was so little that if you covered his head, his feet would show. And if you covered his feet, his head would show. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when you bury him, cover his head and cover his feet with grass. That's how he was buried. This was Musa ibn Umar, That rich, wealthy man. Why am I sharing this example with you? We're not in the battlefield. We're not, you know, we don't have to travel to, from New York to Habasha or Medina, right? To get away from persecution. But we have a mission, and it's the same mission as that of the companions. If somebody comes and says to you, no, 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 the companions, their lives are not relevant to ours. Because that was then, that's a historical context. We need to understand it, but we need to reinterpret all of these values in Islam. This is all garbage. It's garbage because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has given them the certificate. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with Allah. You want to be pleased with them? You want to be pleased with Allah? And you want Allah to be pleased with you? You gotta follow their model. How many times in the Quran, Muhammad Rasulullah in Surah Fatih in particular, Walladina Ma'ahu and those who are with him. Allah honors the Sahaba. He honors the Sahaba in particular, like Abu Bakr al Siddiq in the Quran, he honors him, calling him Thani Athnain in Surah Tawbah. Like he mentions a nickname for, for Abu Bakr al Siddiq. But in, for others, he mentions them in plural, in general. And he, he gives them so many honors in the Qur'an that we can't take away from them and say, no, 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 this is just some intellectual discourse on the side. It has no relevance to how we behave. 